Hi, welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. Today we begin our deep dive into the Beach Boys' fifth album, Shut Down Volume 2, released on March 2nd, 1964. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that usually when I do one of these episodes about a Beach Boys album, I like to put contemporary albums, things that were popular or released around the same time, in these three cubbies. Well, I haven't done that this time because, frankly, I don't have enough original albums from that time period, late 63, early 64, to do that. So instead, please enjoy one of my usual random and unrelated themes in these cubbies. Getting back to Shutdown Volume 2, a few weeks ago in episode 164, Jim Murphy in Conversation, Part 6, I mentioned that these episodes were coming. In the comments section, viewer Finn Kaiser said, I can't wait for Shutdown Volume 2. It has some of the group's greatest triumphs, coupled with some of their worst album filler. As I said in my response, Finn Kaiser pretty much captured my entire take on the album in one concise sentence, so I suppose we could really just end all this discussion here, but instead, let's try to add some context and some detail first, shall we? Sessions began right at the beginning of the year, January 1st, 1964, with two outstanding tracks. Fun, 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 their next single A-side, and The Warmth of the Sun. Why Do Fools Fall in Love was recorded over a couple of days, January 7th and 8th, giving them a B-side for Fun, Fun, Fun. After that, the group were off for their first tour of Australia and New Zealand from January 13th through February 1st. And on February 1st, the single, Fun, 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 and Why Do Fools Fall in Love was released. I'm not sure how much attention the Beach Boys would have been paying to the Beatles up to this point, but by the time sessions resumed on February 19th, the Beatles would have been very much on their minds. I Want to Hold Your Hand had been number one on the singles chart since February 1st, and Meet the Beatles had just hit number one on the album chart that week. Of course, their appearances on the Ed Sullivan Show had been record breakers and showed that the Beatles were not just a new hit group, they were well and truly a phenomenon in the U.S. On that first day back in the studio, February 19th, the Beach Boys recorded Keep an Eye on Summer and Pom Pom Playgirl. The next day, February 20th, they recorded Don't Worry Baby and six other songs, more than half the album, in a mammoth session to get the album completed. It was released only 11 days later, on March 2nd, 1964. 1964 being a leap year, they had an extra day, which I'm sure was not wasted by anybody involved. By the way, I should mention that the dates I'm using come from Keith Badman's book. I've seen some minorly conflicting information, and there might be slightly more to it than this, but as far as I can tell, these dates seem pretty reliable. If you have any more definitive information on those recording dates, please pass it along. I remember the title of Shutdown Volume 2 really confused me when I began collecting the Beach Boys' back catalog in 1980, since there was seemingly no Beach Boy album entitled Shutdown Volume 1. It was probably less confusing at the time. Capital Shutdown compilation had been released back in the summer of 63. It contained two previously released Beach Boys tracks, Shutdown and 409, along with a bunch of other car-related songs. It had been a number seven hit late in the summer, early fall of 1963, making it enough of a hit that most Beach Boys fans would probably have been aware of it. Just in case you had missed it, the album was pictured on the back of Shutdown Volume 2 along with the Beach Boys' other albums. By the time I started looking at Beach Boys discographies, Shutdown was pretty well forgotten and not listed on those discographies. It wasn't until I tracked down a copy of Shutdown Volume 2 and saw Shutdown on the back cover that the mystery was solved for me. I believe it was Peter Flegg who let me know that the album was simply called Shutdown in Taiwan, in Japan, and in Australia. I imagine this was because the Shutdown collection wasn't released in those parts of the world, which would make the title less confusing on one level, but I think would also raise a question about why Shutdown isn't on the album. Shutdown Volume 2 is still a strange album title. All prior Beach Boy albums had been titled after the lead-off single, which is a sensible, if not particularly creative, approach to selling an album. So you'd have expected that this would probably be called Fun, Fun, Fun. I don't know if there was concern about not having a car or surfing reference in the title. It certainly wasn't like the Beach Boys were an unknown commodity in early 1964, and it's hard to see the benefit of calling this Volume 2 of a compilation album, which did well, but not better than their last three original albums. It's also hard to see the benefit of recalling yet again one of their more minor hits from a year earlier. 
Of course, the album was retitled Fun, Fun, Fun when it was part of those dodgy early 80s releases that reissued the early albums with new names and fewer tracks. For this reissue, they dropped Cash's Love vs. Sonny Wilson and In the Parking Lot. If anybody has any insight into the choice of a title, please let me know. We're five albums in and we finally get a new group photo on the front cover. Two of the prior albums had used photos from the 1962 Surf and Safari session at Paradise Cove with photographer Ken Veter. The other two covers didn't show the group at all. New photos were certainly due and a change of personnel made them necessary. Most fans in early 1964 would have been surprised to see a new guy on the cover replacing David Marks. Or maybe they'd noticed him on the picture sleeve for Fun Fun Fun, released prior to the album where he's seated prominently in the foreground. You might have already seen him on stage if you'd been to a Beach Boys concert in the last six months or so. He's not named on the album, so even if you were really observant, you wouldn't have associated him with the A. Jardine in the writing credits on South Bay Surfer from the Surfer Girl album. Also, we see that Brian has adopted a new look, combing his hair forward. Like their last album, Little Deuce Coop, cars are the focus on the new cover. This one at least shows the group, and they're in matching jackets like they formed the car club that they sang about. They're posed around Alan's white 64 Thunderbird, Dennis's blue 63 Corvette, and Carl's turquoise 64 Grand Prix. The liner notes on the back cover emphasize the hot rod angle with lines like, They're scorching down the road, and pull up a bucket seat. Of the 12 songs here, five of them might be considered car songs. And that's being generous in counting the instrumental Shut Down Part 2 and In the Parking Lot as car songs. As the song titles make clear, this is a much more mixed group of songs than the car-themed Little Deuce Coop album. As it transpired, this is probably the most eclectic collection the group ever made. The track listing is out of sequence on the back, which is usually a sign that there was a last-minute rush to complete it, and they had to go to press with the covers before the final track sequence was worked out. Side one of the album kicks off, as you might expect, with the new single Fun 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 written by Brian and Mike. As mentioned, it had been recorded at the first session for the album on January 1st at Western Recorders, along with Warmth of the Sun. Mike Love recalled discussing the idea for the song in a taxi with Brian between the Holiday Inn and the airport in Salt Lake City the morning after a show at the Lagoon Amusement Park. David Marks recalled Brian and Mike writing the song in the hotel after the concert in Salt Lake City. In the Endless Harmony documentary, Brian recalled that he and Mike wrote it in Australia. Of course, they had already recorded it before they went to Australia, so that is easy to eliminate. In any case, the song did not arrive fully blown out of nowhere. During their time in Salt Lake City for their show on September 7, 1963, the group had dropped by radio station KNAK to pay a call on disc jockey and general manager Bill Daddy o Hesterman, pictured here with the group circa 1968. KNAK, and in particular Hesterman, had been early boosters of the Beach Boys, so the group and the people at the station were on friendly terms. Shirley Jackson, daughter of KNAK's owner, worked part-time as a secretary at the station. I came across these photos of Shirley Jackson online, accompanying an informative article by Danielle McKim. During their visit to the station, the group heard that Shirley Jackson had been grounded after borrowing her father's T-Bird to go to the library and having gone to hang out at the local drive-in restaurant instead. It sounds like the whole story was pretty much there. Of course, there was still the small matter of recognizing the potential, writing it up into three concise verses with a bunch of nows at the end of the lines, and developing a catchy chorus. This might be the best Chuck Berry song that he never wrote. Certainly, Carl's intro is very Chuck-influenced, and the whole song really has that sound. Even more, the lyrics are very much in Chuck's concise story-in-a-song vein. Mike Love himself compared it to Barry's lyrics for Nadine. Of course, Nadine couldn't have provided any direct influence. It was released in February 64, the same month as Fun Fun Fun, and at least a month after the Beach Boys had recorded it. Chuck Berry's guitar-driven sound is so distinctive and influential that it's easy to overlook what a great lyricist he was. I've read that that was the thing that other 50s rock and rollers envied and admired most. His ability to tell a story in a few lines and turn a memorable phrase. Mike does the same here, telling a story with a beginning, a middle, and an ending in just over two minutes with plenty of time left for the choruses and Brian's great falsetto during the fade. 
Of course, this is one of the Beach Boys' signature tunes, and to this point, their strongest single A-side. It's also one of the key recordings of the rock era. The single was released on February 1st, 1964. It didn't chart quite as highly as the number three Surf in USA had done almost a year earlier. Fun 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 peaked at number five on March 21st. To be fair, Surf in USA didn't have to contend with Beatlemania. Fun 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 was released right into the middle of it. Ahead of the Beach Boys when the single peaked were three Beatles singles and at number four, Dawn by the Four Seasons. Two weeks later would come the historic chart in which the Beatles would have all of the top five. Under those circumstances, a number five showing was pretty remarkable. As far as album sequencing goes, they were front-loading the good stuff on this album by following Fun 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 with Don't Worry Baby. Obviously, it's modeled on Phil Spector's production for the Ronettes, Be My Baby, released in August of 1963. Of course, it's well known as Brian's favorite record. No doubt, it's a groundbreaking production, beautifully performed, and a great record. From my point of view, Spector could make big, powerful, impressive records. Brian adds another dimension. Don't Worry Baby is both powerful and intimate. I'm sure a musicologist could explain the elements at work here, but there's no doubt that Brian's work speaks to me on much more of a personal level. Spectre is symphonic, Brian is symphonic and poignant. Don't Worry Baby is one of the Beach Boys songs most popular for cover versions by other artists. Many of them rewrite the car racing references in Roger Christian's lyrics. There are far more cover versions than we can possibly get to here, especially when you get into Beach Boy tribute albums, but here are some highlights. Some that changed the car lyrics included P.J. Proby in 1964, the same year as the Beach Boys version, The Tokens in 1970, Brian Ferry in 1973. In 1975, Keith Moon recorded a version. He was well known to be a great Beach Boy fan. Certainly not a great version, but he at least showed some respect by keeping the original lyrics. The Bay City Rollers in 1976 made only minor lyrical changes. B.J. Thomas in 1977 completely replaced the car lyrics. This was the most commercially successful of the covers. It went to number 17 in the late summer of 1977. In 1988, the Everly Brothers with the Beach Boys kept the car lyrics, but changed the last line of the last verse from Nothing Could Go Wrong With You to Love Will Conquer All For You, which may seem more profound, but to me it just seemed like an empty cliche and kind of blunted the emotional impact of the original. And in 1996, again with the Beach Boys, on Stars and Stripes, Volume 1, Lori Morgan's version changed the pronouns and the perspective for a female singer, but kept the original car lyrics. I'm sure a lot of performers thought that the car references reduced an otherwise great song to teen fodder and were attempting to broaden its appeal. And it may have something to do with the fact that I grew up with the lyrics, but that aside, I think the attempts to rewrite it have always weakened the song. By making it general, it makes it less poignant. And it's not difficult to understand the car references as a metaphor for any kind of stress or worry. You don't have to have challenged somebody to a drag race to understand the feeling here. The lyrics might not be sparklingly articulate, but they're direct and have emotional impact, which is more important. Personally, this is one of my all-time five favorite records. Don't Worry Baby is a song I truly love. Without it, at the very least, it's highly doubtful I would be doing a YouTube Beach Boys video every week. In May, roughly two months after its release on Shutdown Volume 2, Don't Worry Baby will become the B-side of the Beach Boys' next single, I Get Around. Despite the fact it's already been out for a while, it'll chart pretty well on its own, reaching number 24 on July 4th, 1964. Up next is another Brian Wilson, Roger Christian co-write and another one of the seven songs recorded at that mammoth recording session on February 20th. It's In the Parking Lot, and I have the feeling that some of the lyrics to this probably didn't come as naturally to Christian as some of his car songs. It seems like a conscious attempt to come up with a song about high school experiences that teenage fans would relate to, as Mike had done so well with the lyrics to Fun, Fun, Fun. It's a fairly undistinguished teen pop tune bookended by some nice doo-wop style group harmonies. Those harmonies have very little to do with the song in the middle. As it starts out, you think you're in for a nice mid-tempo group number, then you quickly find yourself in this sort of fast-paced, simple tune with a Mike Love lead vocal, 
about making out with your girlfriend before school. There's a surf guitar break that starts out promisingly but kind of sputters out pretty quickly. Then it's one more verse, back to the harmonies, and you're out in just over two minutes. In fact, without the harmonies, it's more like one minute, 15 seconds. You could look at this as an early example of working with interchangeable musical sections the way Brian would do with Smile, but that's probably giving it too much credit. Next up is another track recorded on February 20th, Cassius Love vs. Sonny Wilson. It's probably the weirdest track on any Beach Boys album up to this time, and coming in at just over three and a half minutes, it's the longest track on the album and some of its most obvious filler. The track starts out with, Hi, this is Al. And I wonder how many fans in 1964 surmised that the new guy must be Al from that line. As discussed in episode 162, U.S. Pop Culture 1964 Part 2, the Cassius Clay and Sonny Liston heavyweight title fight took place on February 25th, five days after this track was recorded. In a stunning upset, Clay defeated Liston by a technical knockout, becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. About two weeks before this track was recorded, the Beatles arrived in the U.S. and charmed the press and public with their humor. It might have raised the concept that the Beach Boys, too, should be thought of more as personalities than just performers. It does present the Beach Boys as individual personalities at least a little bit, and at the very least lets the casual listener know the difference between a Brian Wilson lead vocal and a Mike Love lead vocal, or that Brian is the one who sounds like Mickey Mouse with a sore throat, and Mike is the one who sounds like his nose is on the critical list. The skit also includes a goofy medley of their greatest hits, which might have reminded listeners to fill in those gaps in their Beach Boys collection. I actually like this for the teen goofiness factor, the guys burning each other with put-downs. It was certainly a relatable part of my high school experience, though the teen put-downs that I remember weren't even this clever or this clean. Next up is Warmth of the Sun. It's obviously an important and key track and we'll want to spend some time on it. Rather than get into it now and give it short shrift, I think we will break. We'll come back next time. We'll pick up there. I hope you enjoyed this. I look forward to your comments. Please hit like and subscribe if you don't mind. And we will see you next time when we will carry on with Shutdown Volume 2. Have a great week. Bye.